All right, beautiful. All right, Eddie, awesome. I love that you are finger picking and it looks like you're doing some strumming and finger picking at the same time. Uh, I like that you are improvising and coming up with your own little bits there because I can tell that you are venturing through the neck and you're noodling and that's a great way to discover that's how you come up, that's how you write, right? Yeah. You, you gotta kinda get out there and experiment and throw stuff out there. We're gonna be talking about that a lot with Melissa today about uh, what it requires you know, to, to have hit or, or to have good lines melodically and uh, lyrically and you gotta throw stuff out there. So exactly what you're doing there, I love that. Uh, finger picking, all that good stuff. Uh, any positive, or I should say, you know, any feedback that would be that would that might help would be the guitar sounds slightly out of tune, and if you could use a pick, you're going to get a lot more vo volume out of the instrument. And I know you're doing some finger picking there. You could do some hybrid type bits, or just actually use the pick itself. But that was really cool stuff, Eddie. And I love the gratitude, and I love that you're in the program. Thank you. Uh, let's do another one, Chris. All right, beautiful. Uh, lefty, like Melissa, right? This works out perfect. It's like when she sat down, I was like, that's why I married you, because this, <laughs> this fits perfectly. It's like that arm's going that way, your neck's going it's that way, mine's be. going. It's meant to be, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you're lefty, like Melissa. Uh, well, I want to talk about your tuning here at some point. Got some crazy, she's got a crazy <laughs> tuning that she uses. I feel like I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Um, so... Okay, love that you as well are venturing throughout the neck. The only criticism that I would have is that the guitar, the, that high E sounds a little bit out of tune. But I love that you're venturing across the neck and I like the camera angle too. It's pretty cool. So great, love it, love it, love it. Um, let's, do, let's go with another one, Chris. Okay, I can tell you that Carson is going places. I can I can tell that guy's playing with passion, and I love the use of the thumb picks and the finger picking. I think that sounds great. Uh, the only thing that I that I would say that you might be able to do that would make all of that sound better is for you to either be wearing some finger picks for the high strings or grow out your nails because that thumb pick, you can really hear that. It's nice and bright. Uh, and the other ones are a little bit dull sounding, but that's just natural when you're using just your fingertips. Usually we'll work with like electrics and that sort of thing, but acoustics, typically you need some sort of something to hit the strings other than the flesh of your finger because it just won't have that resonance like, like that other pick is using. Okay, beautiful. I think, do we have one more guys? Yeah. Okay, one more. Uh, Michael Hammond here from Parsons, Tennessee. This is Sunny in E flat. She likes to be in E flat. And uh, here's a little tune that I've been banking around on.
Beautiful. All right, Michael, love it. And Michael and I met actually at the last meetup that we did at Groon uh, yeah. Guitars. Yeah. That's fine. So uh, pretty cool. So we talked quite a bit, and I love what you're doing there, and I love that you've named your guitar. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I really need to name my guitars because they have personalities. So that was uh, really cool. Again, a tuning sounded like it was a bit of an issue, and you know, I think in three of those four, right, tuning was an issue, and that seems to be honestly the easiest thing to not do or do. It's really easy to go out of tune or to not be in tune, and it's really just equally as easy to fix it. It just tends to be one of those things that we kind of ignore. So, I mean, even right before the program here, we were, we were both tuned to a tuner, but we had to sit there and tweak the guitars because with certain chords, it just didn't sound right. So that's something that you have to do sometimes. So if you can go the extra mile with tuning, my friends, that is is absolutely going to make it sound leaps and bounds better because you can take any great guitar player and put them on a guitar that's slightly out of tune and it's just going to start sounding weird. So, uh, great, great, love it. All right, so friends, keep sending those Rate My Licks. Those are really cool. When you do it, uh, if you would, just a short video. It doesn't have to be five, eight minutes long. Just a short video. You can see how much we're using. So we're definitely chopping them down. Maybe like a minute or so and then introduce yourself and and that's it, okay? Coolio. All right, Melissa, are you ready for some questions? <laughs> I don't know. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the questions first, and then if these are some of your questions, then you can refrain. Uh, but definitely have some questions ready, and we're gonna get going uh, with those right after I do mine, okay? All right. Uh, so, Melissa, I've got some specific questions here, but can you just tell us a little bit about? And just like a brief version of like how you came to Nashville to become a songwriter. Like, what did you do? What, how, what was the process? If you can kind of sum that up in like two minutes or so. Can, <laughs> can you do that? Version. Yeah. yeah. Um, I started writing songs at a pretty young age, at about 13 years old. And I thought that all artists wrote their own songs. So, and I am a very reluctant performer. I don't like to sing. I get a lot of stage fright and so I had come to terms with the fact that I would have to be an artist to write songs because I loved songs that much but then I found out the day I found out that you could write songs for other people was the happiest day of my life and I decided to pack my bags and move to Nashville I went to Belmont University who told you that that you could that you could write songs for other people I this was this is dating myself but back in the days of cassettes okay. I finally I uh, started looking at the bottom right. of the cassettes and it had like the liner notes that had the writers of the song and I started noticing that the artists weren't the ones writing the songs and it would say things like Sony Music Publishing or BMG and I was like, all right, I got to find out about this. And right. so I just kind of threw that, found out about that and was like, that's it, I'm moving to Nashville. Yeah. So yeah. I moved to Nashville, went to Belmont University for a music business because my parents desperately wanted me to be safe and get an education and do the right of, thing. Do the right thing instead of just working at the Bluebird Cafe and paying my dues. Right. Which is what I wanted to do. Yes. Uh, and I took advantage of their internship program at Belmont and started interning for record labels and was able to meet a lot of industry people that way. And at Belmont, met a lot of writers there that I started writing with. And uh, it was through that that I ended up getting my first. Publishing you. I love it. So, and you've been writing for how long professionally? Mm, almost 20 years. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. And how many years before that? I, I started writing at about 13. Okay. So, about seven years before I. Okay. So, you've been doing this a little while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for a minute. So, and, and as far as the writing process, the songwriting process, I think a lot of people probably don't have an idea about this. Like, what it what it looks like, but what would a typical day look like for you when you're going to write? Yeah, some days we write by ourselves, and I think those are always really special songs and important to do, but most of the time our writes are collaborations, and there's usually a, a either artistic or a strategic reason to co-write. You know, if you're a published writer writing with another published writer, it's more people pitching the songs, mm -hmm. and artistically it's just nice to do. And what do you mean by pitching? Like what does oh, it mean? Okay. Yeah, I, 
So we turn in our songs and our publishers typically pitch our songs to record labels, to artists, to management companies to try to get the song placed with an artist. Okay. Um, and then artistically, it's just nice to write with someone who does something different than what you do. So if you're a strong lyricist, writing with somebody who does great melodies, you know, can help elevate the song. And if you're great with melodies and don't really care for, for lyrics, linking up with somebody who does that can be really helpful. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Um, so, but as far as the, the songwriting process, like if you guys go in and write a song, mm -hmm. how long does that take? And like, what would be the very first thing that you guys would do and then... Get coffee. Get coffee, okay. <laughs> so, and... Um, Probably talk a little bit of smack for... About right, and why would okay. you do that? So I always think it's funny because I hear these stories all the time from Melissa and she'll come in and it's like she has these great conversations with people all the time, but that oh, they always seem to end up writing a great song. So there's a lot of chitter chatter, but it's like, there's a reason for that, right? Yeah, I think connecting. it's important to kind of find a common ground and uh, kind of find what you have in common, the way you see things the same and kind of get on the same page. You know, it's like saying you want to, you have an empty canvas and you say you want to paint a butterfly and it's figuring out what colors you're going to paint it, what the shape of it's going to look like, and seeing how you guys see that the same way, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. So just chatting amongst yourselves, talk, you know, stories and what have yeah. you. Well, now... And so we usually will try to land on an idea, you know, something unique, something that hasn't quite been said that way before, mm -hmm. you know, and we'll just run through ideas until there's something that we both you know, or th three of us, however many of us are in the room, kind of see the same way. Some days we're trying to shoot for an artist. Some days we're trying to just write a great song. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then just kind of finding the melody. So it's different every day. Some days we start with a melody that somebody brings in. Some days we start with an idea or a piece of lyric. It really just depends on what inspires mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Now, I've always said if you can have a great conversation, you can write a great song. Mm -hmm. yeah. And And... Vice versa. Yeah. If you can't find a common ground to kind of connect with, it makes writing a song because it's really difficult. vulnerable, right? You have yeah. to. You have to. Number one, you have to throw out lyrics. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of folks watching right now because I get it all the time. Is they're scared to get on stage, and then in the writing process, I would imagine they would be nervous too, just like I have been before, to where. You have a line yeah. or a melody or an idea, and you want to throw it out there. It's not unlike any other process where you're working with other people, and you have an idea, and you're in, it's in a group, and you have to say it out loud. You you have this gut feeling that maybe it's good, and you want to say it out loud, but you could also be rejected. So there's a lot of that, right? And some you, you, sure. I mean, there's still days I feel like that. It just depends. I mean, I could th I I have some songs that have been recorded that I maybe threw out that idea to 10 different writers, yeah. and it was the 10th writer that saw it the same way, or saw it differently, or saw it in an angle that made it work. So I, I read a great book, uh, Stephen King, on writing, and it was his process, and it changed the way I thought about ideas and throwing out lines, because he said, there is no one idea. There's only two ideas that come together uh, and spark something creative. Mm -hmm. And so it made me less fearful of throwing out an idea or throwing out a line because really if it doesn't work then just the other part of whatever it is that makes that work hasn't happened yet or mm. isn't with the right person right. so uh, that kind of has helped me calm my nerves of yeah. being fearful because really we're all just creative people trying to do the same thing yeah. you know it's yeah. just how we see it so you've written with uh, all in Nashville. I mean, you've written with, the, yeah, you've written with, with all the, the, the top songwriters that you, if you're into songwriting and you know what's happening in Nashville, you write pop, you write country, you write film and TV. Um, but you've mentioned certain writers to me that you'll come home and you say, gosh, this, you know, I'm writing with this person. They're just so easy to write with. One of those, one of those uh, people are Jeff Steele, who wrote <laughs> yeah. uh, a bazillion of songs that, you know, like What Hurts the Most and, right? Yeah. Uh, just My so, Wish. Yeah. I mean, everything. He's yeah. Just a monster. Hall of Fame songwriter. And what, what about Jeff that is a characteristic of some of the 
the better songwriters or what makes a better songwriter, not necessarily talent wise, although he's a beast, but like what about that personality like Jeff has that makes it a great thing to be in the room with somebody like him when you're writing? Because you've mentioned it to me and I, I know what it is, but I want you to, to let other folks know. Because he's just such a light and he has such a generosity of spirit. I mean, he could do anything. He can play anything. He can write anything. I mean, he's a brilliant uh, melody guy, lyricist, but he makes you feel like a rock star. That's he comes in and he just, uh, he makes you feel like you're the talented one in the room. Mm -hmm. And it just opens up. It just and you can't you can't say a, a, a stupid line, right? Because he would no, never, yeah, never he would make never you feel, make bad. You feel yeah. bad about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he said something to me that he said a while back uh, that he started coming into the room and just saying, you know, God, what do you have today? Mm -hmm. What's in the room today? And I feel like even just that spirit of opening it up to just being open to whatever's in the room isn't forcing your own right. perspective of what you think should happen that day. Right. And uh, I think that leaves more room for the magic to happen yeah. when it happens. Yeah. So this song that you opened up with, Red Light, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that, at least as far as... So that was recorded by David Nail. It was recorded by David Nail, yeah. And uh, went to top five, top six. Top five song, yeah. And uh, so that's pretty amazing. Um, I remember when Melissa came home and said, hey, this new artist by the name of David Nail is going to be recording this song, and we're really hopeful for it. I think that wasn't there was another artist uh, who had cut it and did and then did Man, you're you remember remembering that? more than me. I don't remember. Was it Keith Urban? Keith Urban had the song on hold, but he didn't cut it. Okay. I don't think anyone actually I thought there was cut an, it. Okay. Okay. Well, nonetheless. so oh, That so, was probably just time. Oh, yeah, but it was with some the same writers. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, lots of drama, not drama, but a lot of ups and downs in the songwriting world because you'll have, I mean, there's been so many times where an artist has cut a song from Melissa or anybody else, they all, all the songwriters go through this, where they this famous artist records their song and it's like, oh man, this one's going on the album and it may or it may not, but... You know, of course, you're always hoping that it does, and they recorded the song, so that's a pretty good sign. But a lot of times, artists might record 30 or 40 songs for a 10-song album. That's why and we so, always say, I'll believe it when it's in shrink wrap. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Believe it? laughs> oh, anything can happen up exactly. until the last minute. Exactly. So uh, so you got this cut, mm -hmm. and it was a killer song. You just heard it. It's an amazing song. And, uh, and it just creeped up the chart for a year. It was the longest running single that year. It was on the charts for uh, 42 weeks. And you said, I think you had set a, some sort of country record at did, that time. I it did that year. I think maybe since there's been yeah. songs that have been longer, but uh, that song that year yeah. it was. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about like the process of that song? Like what happened that day? Why is that song? Why do you believe that song special? How did it come about? The title, like... Can you can you riff sure. about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I wrote the song with uh, my mentor and dear friend uh, Jonathan Singleton, or Dennis McCoskey has been a mentor to me for years, and dear friend Jonathan Singleton. Dennis who wrote Maniac. Dennis from... McCoskey wrote Maniac. You'll think of me. Uh, I just call you mine. Uh, I need you, Leanne Rhymes. Huge yeah. songs. Yeah. Never mind the huge career he had in L.A. Yes. too. Yeah. Di Diana Ross. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I wrote with um, with uh, Dennis and Jonathan, and we had I had had this idea, Red Light, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with it, and I had remembered a conversation that Eric and his brother had when their father passed away, and they had walked out of the hospital, and it was a sunny day, and there were people laughing and, you know, walking to their cars, and uh, his brother said, you know, it's just a sunny day for everybody else and our world just stopped and so we kind of got the idea and rounded it from there of just the thought of you know goodbyes don't always look the way you think they're gonna look and um and so we wrote it as a kind of heartbreak song but that mm -hmm. was kind of the inspiration behind it and then david neil recorded it and yeah it top five yeah. and so dude's sitting in the car and his girlfriend looks over at him and is like it's over it's over He's yeah like, what the hell yeah. Everything like little kids it's playing a sunny with a ball, day. or yeah. Like, yeah, like it's not raining. It's not. It doesn't it's look no, nothing the way sad. That it's I just, should look yeah. like. Yeah, I love. I love that concept. I love that idea, and that I love that song. Um, you have written. <laughs> I, I embarrassingly say you've written a songwriting book. 
<laughs> that, that we have been sitting on for a few years now. But we really, prom I promise you, we really are getting around to it. Uh, not getting around to it. It's like in the final stages here. We just have a couple little things that we need to do. And I apologize to you guys. But obviously, we've had a few things going on. But that's, that's, uh, that's coming out soon. And I won't ask you about that just because... Uh, but but nonetheless, Melissa has an amazing uh, songwriting book. Bless, bless you. Thanks. Um, oh, thank you so much for the, for the uh, donation here. Aww. And Gary, we, and, and whenever we get a donation like that, I like to go straight to them. Uh, did you write any songs for Aladdin, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast <laughs> anime? Do they get published with your name on them? Uh, I wish. I well, wrote you do any have songs, songs for, for But, yes, I write for Disney Music Publishing, so I write for uh, some of their film and TV projects. I've written some things for the Disney Channel, for um, live-action movies, for animated series. Um, Star Darlings was one of the animated series I've written for... Uh, the end titles of some movies like Bears uh, had the end title of that that Olivia Holt recorded. Um, some of their Christmas songs, Al Olivia Holt, um, Sabrina Carpenter, um, and then the Happily Ever After song I've written for the theme park in Magic Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And did you do something? You had something on Little Mermaid. Oh, yeah, yes. I did. I had Little Mermaid's greatest hits. Uh, I got to do a mashup of a song uh the real thing is what the song's called, but it was uh, Kiss the Girl. Uh, so I can say that my I've written with Alan Menken. And, I love uh, that. and Alan Menken, if you guys don't know, is... Is the guy who's written all of those songs in uh, Aladdin like Aladdin and, and Beauty, or Beauty and the Beast, I think, and Little Mermaid. So he, that yeah. was really special and cool <laughs> with Andy Dodd. I love it. I love it. Um, what were some of these songwriters that inspired you the most growing up? Um, and do you remember, say, like the first one that we were just like, dear Lord, that's a song? I mean, I grew up on Elton John and Billy Joel, you know, as songwriters and Billy Joel. I grew up in the North, and so I always felt like Billy Joel wrote country music in the North. Mm -hmm. the, the pictures that he drew of living in the North mm -hmm. was really inspiring to me, and that was kind of what first got me into country music, and then Reba and Garth obviously. But then the first songwriter that I remember getting into when I started learning about songwriters was Matresa Berg. Uh, mm -hmm. She's, uh, who is a dear friend now and we write together quite a bit. Uh, and it's still surreal to me as I look at her plaques up on the wall of Strawberry Wine and uh, You and Tequila. And, but just pretty much every song in the 90s that a female had out that really, I was really inspired by 90s country music and uh, those songs, a lot of those female songs, is what got me excited about writing. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, as far as as far as say, like maybe the top three, would you say that would be Billy Joel, Matresa? I yeah. mean, would would Matresa be up in there? I mean, yeah. Okay. I mean, for sure. I mean, as far as like. I mean, Matrice is an artist in her own right, too, but yeah. just as far as, like, a professional songwriter that was the first one that I really dug into and then started seeing all the songs that she was writing. Mm -hmm. It's really just kind of astounding. She's in the Hall of Fame now, too. Wow. Songwriter oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So a few years ago, I remember you coming home and saying, uh, I got a text from somebody saying he was Garth Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who is punking me right now? Like, <laughs> and this started a whole thing uh, where you, it was actually Garth Brooks. Yeah. And uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the, those initial, like, what was going on and where that led and the whole nine yards there? He was recording an album a few years ago, uh, his first new album in 16 years, and he happened to stumble on a song I wrote with uh, Chris Wallen and Stephen Lee Olson, called Cold Like That, and uh, he recorded that, and then he found this song of mine that was 15 years old. It was one of the first songs I wrote in my first publishing deal, so if that gives any hope to, mm. like, you just never know where a song's going to land or what life it's going to take. And he loved the song, but he, uh, he wanted to make some changes to it and wanted us to rewrite some of it, so we actually got to get together with him and write... I got to write with Garth Brooks. That's crazy. And you it's had crazy. how many songs on on the first on this this album that came out? 
not two, too long ago. Two, two songs. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. And he was the coolest. And human I can ever. and I'll tell a story. Melissa is very, very modest, so she won't I always have to like coax stuff out of her. <laughs> but Garth had invited us to a concert and this was in Indiana or Kentucky, do you Kentucky. Remember? In Kentucky. It was huge. Yeah. I, it was like It was Louisville, right? I don't I think know. So. I don't remember. Anyway. But huge, you know, stadium and we met him beforehand, or I met him beforehand, you know, a little meet and greet and all that good stuff. And after the show, or during the show, he's doing his finale, you know, or his encore, bah, 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 just smacking around the guitar, walking, you know, from this side of the stage to the other. The crowd's just going mad, <laughs> just absolutely going mad. Uh, I love Garth, I, I truly do, but at that moment, what well, were you well, doing? Let me, let me, what were you doing? Well, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> what did first. Garth see you doing? So, I, I was actually texting or probably po making a post for my Instagram or something, right? I love Garth, but it was a long concert and, and <laughs> it, it was great. But nonetheless, at that very moment, in a stadium of I don't know, I was 20, singing 20, at the people. top of my. Lungs. She was singing at the top of my I lungs. I was enjoying the. Concert. And how this guy did this, I don't know, but he literally during this part, he he's playing his guitar he leans over like this we're in the crowd and he lifts his head up and he looks over at a sea of people and somehow sees melissa in there and me texting and he <laughs> and he says and he says melissa you're having a good time and like literally just said that over his earpiece and i'm and i just looked at her and i said did he just say melissa are you having a good time and she goes yes it is and i'm like great i was sitting there texting or doing whatever it looked like i wasn't having fun at all but there are cra crazy happenings and that guy is a, a class act he's such a class such act. a sweet guy yeah there's not I, enough nice things to say i love it Okay, friends, we're going to get to some questions. I still have a lot more questions for you. We're, we're still going to do a rapid fire at the end and all that good stuff. Uh, but let's, can, can we take some questions from, from the kids? Sure, whatever okay. you want to do. So we're going to head over to Facebook first, okay? And if you would, please make sure that you put a question mark and do it all, uh, all caps if you can, because that just allows me to be able to see things better. Cool? All right. Uh, Larry saying, do you worry about getting the melody down first and then the signature, the time signature later? Huh. I think, you know, this, it, the, it the time signature is, is almost like we, almost always musicians four, don't four. even think yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're definitely Sometimes getting the melody six, first. Eight, but, but what about melody and, and lyrics first? Like what, how, how's that process? It's different every day. Some, some days we come in and might have a piece of a melody that came to us that day or had been working on. Some days it's an idea and then the me melody follows. The, the mel melody's inspired by the idea or the idea's inspired by the melody. Uh, you know, some days we're writing with people that build demos, track people, and so, you know, some days they may have a demo pretty close to made, and then we kind of see what idea fits in that. Mm -hmm. It's just different every day. Uh, people are literally getting mad at me here that you haven't been on more, so <laughs> I understand that. Why isn't she a guest more often? You're right, right? I, it's like the cobbler's sh kids' shoes, right? The cobbler's kids' shoes always have holes in them, yeah. and this is like we we talk we joke about it all the time. Uh, it's because I get so nervous about things like yeah. this, so I. Well, not... you're you're great, and so and let that inspire you, friends. Like Melissa comes from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, the least most country or songwriting place. Yeah. You, know, you would be surprised yeah. how many people came from Pennsylvania. Like, I've met more people in the songwriting community really? that came from PA, which really? is crazy. So, and uh, nervous about playing out and what have you, just like me. That's, yeah. Because we are, we're more like creators than we are performers. Yeah. I always pictured myself as more of a creator than, than a performer, too. I don't, if I never performed, I think I would be fine. But creating is something that I, that I got to do. Yeah. Uh, what inspires this song usually? Melody, lyrics, or does the rhythm ever inspire the songs? Um, it's kind of the same answer. Yeah, it, uh, it's different every day. The, sometimes it's the idea that inspires the song. Sometimes it's the melody. Uh, it really, it's really just a feel thing most of the days. I mean, it's just like it, when you're writing at home, just finding the thing that you're feeling that day. Hmm. 
ever created a song that was to be played fast, but then was changed to, to a slow beat or vice versa? Yes, and I heard an inspiring story about this with a hit song, and it's made me look at all of my songs differently now. If a song's not working, then I'll try to see if it could be a tempo or slow, but I don't know if you remember the song, I Can't Make You Love Me, which is one of my favorite songs of all time. Mm. Uh, Mike Reed and Alan Shamblin wrote it. Uh, Bonnie Raitt performed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wrote it as an up-tempo bluegrass song, I think, and it was like, I can't make you love me if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like it was like seven or eight years old and hadn't gotten cut, and one day Mike Reed sat down at the piano with Alan. They were in a write and just kind of as, I don't know if it was as a joke or he just sat down and he... And turn down the lights, turn down the bit. And it just slowed it down Lisa. on piano. And Alan yes. was like, oh my gosh. Did Alan wrote this that one now. with him? Yes. Mm -hmm. Alan Shamblin's another one of those songwriters for me, like Matresa. He's a house that built me, a lot of the songs that inspire me to write. Um, but yeah, so they, they slow down that song, and that's, that's what made that song so magical so ever since i heard that yeah i try to play around with tempos and you know a lot of times ballads are really hard to get cut so if we write it as a ballad we'll see if we can speed it up to just because it's got a better chance at being recorded but uh yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so amber's asking my question would be what are your top tips for playing and singing at the same time <laughs> i'm still trying to figure that out <laughs> um for playing and singing at the same time. You know, I I just have to practice to death. I just have to practice things so many times for it to just even sound like it's acceptable to play. I have to just practice uh, till I'm comfortable with it. But usually I just, um, I don't know if it's maybe just because I write playing and singing at the same time that that doesn't seem to be as much of an issue but it, I just practice the guitar part usually more for me than the singing and then put that over it once I'm comfortable with mm -hmm. the guitar part if I'm playing out for a show or something. Yeah yeah and I do have a video on that and a course on that. Uh, YouTube just search your guitar stage singing playing. I have a video on that that's free and then if you're inside the unstoppable guitar system do the same search singing and playing. I have a whole course on that. So Ryan's asking, would you say songwriting, especially on your scale, becomes more of a talent gift versus practicing endlessly? Um, Bukowski had a great quote to me in one of his books. He said, when, ta uh, when spirit leaves, form appears. And uh, I feel like it's the spirit that gets you into it. It's the talent, if you want to say that. Uh, but I just think it's hard work. I mean, I, I talked to a studio musician once who had, is one of the master players that's played for over 30 years. And I said, have you seen any difference in the people that make it than the people that don't, talent-wise? And he said, the people that stick around make it and the people that don't, don't. And mm -hmm. I really think that's the uh, hard and simple answer is just, just working at it and working at it and staying in it and not giving up and... Uh, I feel like that has a lot more to do with it than talent, although mm -hmm. I think there are incredibly talented people doing it. I think at, at the level of professional songwriting, I feel like everybody that has a deal right now is somebody that's extremely talented. But the people that are successful at it, or even to have a deal at this stage of the game with uh, how the industry's changed, are just hustlers and hard workers. Hard workers, yeah. Yeah, I don't know anybody who's extremely successful, successful that is more talented than hardworking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's what I would have guessed that that would have been your answer. I've never seen that with anything. Um, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's soccer or playing guitar or songwriting, like whatever. Uh, it's like I always say, do what it is that you want to do because if you're going to fail in something, you might as well fail in something that you that you love doing yeah. because there's somebody else who's going to be working harder than you at whatever it is that you do. So you might as well do something that you really truly love, songwriting, something that you've always loved. Yeah. So it was nothing for you to book eight hours, ten hours in a day and, and just be like, yeah. that's not a lot of time. Like, yeah. it's not enough time, you know? I was obsessed with it. Yeah. I just, I had to eat, sleep, and breathe songs. Whether I was writing it or just listening to songs or listening to albums, I used to go and buy stacks of albums to just listen to songs and mm -hmm. find the best songs and yeah. fi figure out why they were well written mm. and what made them special. Yeah. 
just obsessed. I love it. Uh, Joe is on Facebook saying, Melissa, I've been invited to perform at my first uh, writer's festival, Black Warrior Songwriters Festival in Alabama. How do you prepare for and select a song to perform in a writer's round? Once in it, how do you approach presenting your song? Um, okay, can you roll mm -hmm. that back so yeah. I can look at it? Um, how do I prepare for uh, A lot of times I am preparing songs that have been recorded by other people, which I always think is hilarious because I tend to get a lot of mail, very gritty mail uh, cuts or recordings, and I, you got Minnie Mouse singing it. And so I always think it's funny that, like, in, I think in my mind I'm Chris Stapleton, but when it comes out it's more like Minnie Mouse. So I, I have to usually sing songs that I've had recorded, but then within that I really just see what it is I can pull off uh, vocally and what I'm comfortable playing with because I feel like being comfortable with it and mm -hmm. really loving what I'm playing is the most important mm -hmm. thing. Uh, and then there was a third part of that question. No, that was it. I think that was, was just, it? Yeah, I think that was just the two. Uh, here's another one that uh, that that came up and uh, I, I knew we'd have to answer it, but it's good. <laughs> Got to give the kids some truth here. So Rusty on Facebook's asking, what does it take to be a successful songwriter and not live in Nashville or LA? Man. What did Mr. Huff tell you? Yeah. <laughs> so when I first moved to town, I uh, re met, for those of you who know Dan Huff, legendary guitar player and producer, I met his father, who was a string player and arranger in Nashville. And he said, I can tell right now by looking at you, you're not going to take no for an answer, so I'll tell you what I told my son. And that's true. <laughs> Which is, um, you've got to move here, and you've got to, if you want to fish, you got to be where the fish are. And so I think if you want to do it professionally, you have to be in the community and getting to know people and networking. And uh, there are a select few people that have made it work from other places uh, that live in other places. But I would say probably even 95% of them started here and then moved. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's extremely difficult to make it work from the outside because it really is all about your um, relationships yep. and developing that. And he also said, you know, soaking in the culture of the music city that you're living in will teach you more about writing than any bit of advice that I could give you. And there really is something to being in the community and seeing where trends and songs are going. We're kind of writing what's going to be on the radio two to three, five years from now. And so you kind of feel a shift in music and where mm -hmm. it's going. And if you're not in that, it's hard to feel where that shift is going and just the quality of writing. When I was outside of it, I didn't understand the quality and the level of writing that was going on inside this town until I was just constantly surrounded by people who were better than I am. I'm still surrounded by people that are better than I am every day. And uh, having to write up to that, it, I think, uh, keeps you keeps your tools sharp. Yeah, yeah. So um, someone had just written here another one. Oh, here we go. Um, so the way that you tune your guitar, <laughs> and in fact, uh, Daddy-O may be watching right now, your dad actually <laughs> strung the guitar up a certain way because Melissa... How did you know that? How did they know that? Because I've talked about it a bunch. Oh. <laughs> That's crazy. So here, Ryan saying, Eric has mentioned the diff... Well, because I was... Because I would say, you know, like, uh, people would say, well, I do this or I do that. Is that okay? And yeah. I say, well, my wife plays her guitar backwards and upside down and all... And, and uh, <laughs> C, minor C minor open chord with the sixth string gone. Uh, and so, like, it kind of doesn't matter. It's like if Stevie Ray Vaughan breaks rules, no one's going to say, Stevie Ray Vaughan, you broke a rule. Stop doing that. You, you're not playing very well. And no one's going to tell you that you can't write a song because you're doing it. You, you have a pr proven track record. You're on 12 million albums, and, and you're going strong. So, um, But your dad, seeing that you were a piano player, wanted to come up with a way, right, for, for, for the guitar to be strung. Mm -hmm. And how, so, did that, how did that go about? I grew up on piano, about? and that's what I was comfortable with. And I tried to pick up the guitar stuff. This was long before I met you. So had I been right. with you, I'm sure, sure I would have learned You'd have been in the, the unstoppable guitar system. Obviously. Well, that goes without saying. <laughs> But since I hadn't met you yet, and it was before YouTube, right. uh, I uh, 
I just wasn't getting the guitar. It didn't make sense to me the way the piano did. And so my dad taught me how to string it up. So it was literally like playing the piano. You know, it's like that was a C, that was a C, and then it would just go up the neck, major, minor. So uh, the advantage. So every chord, every chord's a bar chord. Every chord's a bar chord. You know, so the advantage of it is that. Especially when writing like bluegrass things, I can go up the neck really quickly yeah. to chords that are maybe a little harder, yeah. playing it the correct way. Yeah. Uh, so the advantage is I kind of write in a way that's just slightly different melodically. Mm -hmm. uh, the disadvantage is that I'm I'm held to that. I I'm not finger picking or playing correctly in a way that would sound beautiful. I'm really locked into playing the way I play, which serves me very well for writing, but. Uh, you know, it's not a very interesting mm -hmm. way of playing as far as like when I'm playing shows. It's, yeah. But it gets the I, job done. I would done. be much better served being in the Unstoppable I don't know. guitar system. Uh, well, I don't know. I think as far as songwriting, it, what what you do makes makes a whole lot of sense. And it it's, gets the it's job like you get, You're playing major and minor chords 99% of the time yeah. anyhow. So and, and then people demo that we demo our songs. So it's What does that know, mean? Can you give can you give So it's very rarely in this uh, this state when people hear it. It's mm -hmm. you know usually we go into the studio or we're writing with someone who creates a demo and builds a track as we go along with all the instrumentation and then usually we get someone to sing on it or a writer in the room that is a great singer. Mm -hmm. to pitch it for an artist because you know if I was singing the demo you wouldn't necessarily hear it for David Nail or for Tyler Farr but having you know Jonathan sing on it who's got that gritty male vocal really mm -hmm. helps translate that idea a lot better and mm -hmm. even female wise if I was pitching a song to Carrie Underwood having me sing it I don't have that power mm -hmm. that she has so I can write those melodies <clears throat> but but as far as translating it in a way that the artist can mm -hmm. really hear having having it in a demo form is a lot more advantageous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for those folks that don't know, when you when you guys write a song, you make a a scratch tape of it that day, or uh -huh. a work tape, what they call a work tape, right? So it's, you just have it's just phone an audio out, memo, on and you phone. just put it out. So you've got the chords and you've got the melody right there. Yeah, and then. The guys here in the studio, or nowadays, it seems that you're working with someone who's going to do the track. So they listen to it, or they remember the chords, and then they start building the track, and they create this demo with either professional, whatever, yeah, with professional players, yeah, who great guitar players, great singers, and the whole nine yards. So it sounds more like a record, so that when a producer or an artist hears it, they're like, "Oh, I love this song," and then now it goes into the third stage, which is when the night. And the artist records it, right? And a lot of times now, there's a writer in the room who plays everything, who actually creates the demo themselves and plays everything on it mm -hmm. and is a co-writer on the song. Uh, here's a question I think, uh, I'm not sure what the answer to this is here, but hello, I heard you had a song covered by Keith Urban. Was that a song you collaborated or did you write the song, the whole song, and how much can a person change your song if they want to record it? Any limitations? I'm not sure hmm. what that's referring to, but... Um, um, I did have... Keith Urban not, cut a song of mine, but it didn't end up making the album. Now, Garth might have changed something right or I don't know I've, I've well I might yeah with my Gar stories up with Garth um was that a song you collaborated on how much did you write the whole song how much can a person change your song um they can change it uh you know basic changes if they want to change anything more than that then they would usually become a writer on the song uh if it's major changes uh, in the case of Garth he was so gracious that he he wrote the song with us, but he wouldn't take any credit on it, which is kind of unheard of and a super class act. He, I mean, he definitely wrote enough on it to uh, be entitled to part of the song, but he was really gracious about mm -hmm. not not wanting that. He just wanted the song to be to be what fit him as an artist. And I can listen to it, and it's like what he brought to it melodically was so surreal to listen to Garth creating a melody that are like the melodies I grew up listening to of his and I could see where the song wasn't quite melodically what he would have done mm -hmm. so you know he he changed that in a way that fit him 
Uh, but normally, if there was going to be that much change to a song, they would have just been a writer mm -hmm. on the song. And a lot of times now, the artist is in the room with us. There, it's you, We still get our outside songs cut every here and now, but um, uh, for the most part, we're writing with artists and that they kind of help dictate along the way what it is they're wanting to say and look for and we're kind of there to help facilitate that mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's take this last one on Facebook. Would you do another song for us? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So let's take this last one on Facebook. We will hear another song from Alyssa and then we'll go over to, to YouTube. Okay. So. Um, Last one here on Facebook from Ben is saying, how long on average to write a song? Do you start a song and shelve it for a while? Um, on a daily basis, usually I'm writing a song a day when I'm co-writing with other people for my job. Uh, we usually write a song in a day. Some songs take two or three times. Some songs have taken a year uh, to step away from and come back. Um, it's different for every song, but on on the uh, on the whole, we write a song in a sitting. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, you might. Have and maybe to... that's five six hours mm -hmm. together, and yeah. you know a little bit longer if we're doing a demo. The With same one day. or two other songwriters. With one or two other songwriters, mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Okay, my friends, really quickly, uh, let's let's go to the bit that we have here on Instagram. We have a post on Instagram. I just want to call the attention to that really quickly. And there you go. So that beautiful girl right there, my <laughs> lovely wife, what you do is you want to go to my Instagram, you want to be following, like that, leave a comment, and share. And what that means is you share it in your story, okay? And then we also have one on Facebook as well. Like, comment, share there as well. And then after the program, we're going to pick someone to win a lifetime membership to the Unstoppable Guitar System slash 365. Also, guys, do we have a link for the, the special that's going on right now? Okay, listen, we had a big old broadcast, a big old monster broadcast this weekend about playing chords all over the neck. And in that live broadcast, we announced that we're doing 75% off all products except for UGS slash 365, which is 55% off. So I think it was like 100 and 222 dollars off, something like that. Basically, it equated to less than $15 a month for one year for lifetime guitar lessons. So literally over a thousand videos, over 600 jam tracks, and we continue to fill this, this system up with some amazing uh, guitar lessons. So if you want to take part of that, the link's in the description of this video. If you've ever thought about joining UGS slash 365, now's the time to do it. Or you can wait till after the, 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 um, the, uh, thing that we're doing here and then it'll be up to 400 bucks again but don't do that 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 wouldn't be smart click the link that's in the description of the video okay that's it uh what what is this next song um which one do you want me to are we doing two more two more or um maybe one? maybe we could do one at the end as okay. well is that cool yeah, maybe on sure. the way out um okay. so i'd I'll say yeah, whatever you want or, to do. Or what, what you yeah, think? yeah, do hurt, and then and maybe guy walks into a bar at the end. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about this song? So this song I wrote with uh, my friends John Green and Ben West, and John Green lives in the UK, and uh, Ben West lives in Detroit, and so getting the three of us together in Nashville uh, in the same room only happens about once a year, if we're lucky. Um, and we had had this day on the books and we got together and I'm sure our publishers wanted us to write a big up-tempo positive hit for summer. We were something all new. Something new, yeah. And we were just all in this melancholy kind of mood and I had had this sad idea. And um, we wrote it and we got done with it and it fell out pretty effortlessly. And uh, we got done with it and said, man, we love this song, uh, but I don't know if anybody's going to cut this. It's a slow ballad and... You know, so we turned it in and it started getting on hold for artists and it was on hold for a few different artists. And then Charles Kelly of Lady Annabellum called and said that he wanted uh, to record it for his solo album that he was doing. And uh, he took it into the studio, he recorded it and he called us back and he said, man, it just 
something about it wasn't right. It didn't quite work out. Uh, so I'm going to have to let go of the song. And he kind of said in passing, you know, but maybe when Lady Annabellum's looking in about a year, year and a half from now, maybe we'll take another look at it. And uh, we were just devastated because sure. we were like, I'm sure he'll remember it a year from now. And, you know, they'll move on and want a newer song. And sure enough, about a year and a half later, uh, he called uh, my co-writer John back and said, I think I figured out what was wrong, what didn't work with it. I think it's a female song, and I think that Hillary is supposed to sing it. I think the emotion of it Yay. is female. Yay! <laughs> and so they recorded it, and it's on their album that's out right now, Heartbreak. Uh, and it's one of my favorite songs. It's so beautiful. It's called Heart. If my memories get the best of me, then I'll always find an excuse. Yeah, I'll make believe, rewrite history, ignite a spark. Starts out simple like a conversation. And before I know it, I'm lost in your illumination. If you catch my eye across a crowded room, I'll fall into the atmosphere surrounding you. And if you pull me close, just a day. beautiful i love that one Thank if i was a crying man i would be crying <laughs> that's, seriously it's so beautiful um mm. 
Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so friends, we are going to head on over. I love all the sweet messages that, that look at this. Melissa has such an angelic voice. Aww. She's wonderful, absolute delight. Everybody writes <laughs> such sweet comments. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> such a lucky guy, indeed. Indeed I am. Okay, who told the angels to sing, right? Oh, the first time I heard goodness. Melissa sing, I was just like, oh my goodness, this voice. Uh, okay, so let's get to some questions here on, oh, i tell you what, I'm going to, no, we'll get to questions on Facebook. I might jump in here with some more questions. We're still going to do rapid fire at the end. We're going to go about another 25 minutes, my friend, my friends, and then um, hmm. we're going to do Q&A. What's that? Uh, did, did you see, did you see some uh, question up here or something? That yeah. You know? Yeah. So how do you balance being a mom and parents of a toddler oh, with our careers? Oh yeah, right. I yeah. Three young kids what do you want to say? Typing. What do you want to say about that? Um, I feel like it's a big it's a big deal. It's like a the yeah. real deal. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> it's, it's always. Question. I feel like when I'm being a great songwriter, I'm being a mediocre parent, and when I'm being a great parent, I'm being a mediocre songwriter, and so. I just always am trying to balance doing the best by both. I mean, obviously my son first, but um, but I love writing too. So, yeah. but I also think having children has given me laser focus because <clears throat> now I know what I'm doing it for, and so I feel like I'm much more efficient with my time than I used to be. If no I'd have had this efficiency as a songwriter when I was 20, yeah, I would have been so much more productive. Mm. We need a catalyst to to um, make us know what's important and what's not. Yeah. Right. Time wise. Yeah. yeah. But it is. It's such a challenge. I find that I find the same <clears throat> thing, and so you know, Melissa and I are always shifting back and forth with little E. Uh, you, the majority of the time, but you know, shifting back and forth. You know, she has an event, or um, like last Sunday, you had the WhamCon. Yeah. Uh, she had an event where she was speaking at that was young women in the music business industry. And uh, and so I was watching the little guy. And then other times when I'm doing the broadcast, she's watching them or we have a babysitter. Yeah. And uh, It takes a village. Takes and a, a good village, team member. Yeah. I mean, just having somebody that's as passionate as you are about what they do and about being a parent. Really yeah. Helps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can, you tell us, can you tell us about your melody writing process? Um, I, I don't really have a process other than just trying to find a melody that moves me. I, you know, I don't know, always know on a daily basis if those decisions are right decisions or not. I think it kind of comes out, you know, whether it's a song that I end up playing for people and they love or not. Sometimes the things I love are not the things my publishers love. Sometimes, uh, they love things that I don't get necessarily. So I'm just always trying to write something that moves me personally mm -hmm. melodically and uh and then i whittle away at it so usually there's some part of it that moves me emotionally mm -hmm. and then i try to throw out the rest and then just keep working on a melody until every part of it is something mm -hmm. i love because i think it's really easy to find one part of it you love and just go with it yeah. and write the whole thing but just keep trying to make that melody at every part the best I think, you know, in what we're doing, you only have people's attentions for a very short amount of time in the pitching process. I mean, and on radio, too. I mean, you know when you love a song and when you turn the dial after 30 seconds or something or a minute. So uh, I think it's just, you know, continuing to try to make it the best song at every stage of the the game. Mm. Mm hmm. Love it. So... Someone's asking, and I, I'll, I want to mention something about this, but I want to hear your answer first. Uh, are you proficient in theory? <laughs> no. I mean, I think I have a pretty good ear for things, and I think I, I you know, I know the national She has a better system. ear than I do, for sure. Like, I'll be sitting there listening to a song, and I'll be picking it out, and she'll be like, she'll be, you know, fixing dinner or doing something in the kitchen. She'll say, minor two, <laughs> major three, and whatever I'm like. <laughs> but I feel like the theory... No guitar in her hand, she just knows it. I feel like the theory I know comes from piano playing and yeah. knowing the number system through playing piano. It mm -hmm. just makes sense a little bit more, yeah. I think. But uh, but no, I, I would get schooled in theory very, very quickly. That being said, the theory that she does know, which has everything to do with diatonic theory, which is what I 
beaten to your guys' heads all the time, the nine essential chords and what chords make up a chord family in regards to a key and that sort of thing. Well, this is really, really, really good at, and, and it's not even so much like theory as you would know it, like writing it down. We mentioned this a lot, like one artist will say, oh, I don't know any theory, but their ear knows the theory. They just don't know the labels behind it. Uh, yeah. Melissa does. She'll be able to say, okay, that's a minor three, that's a major four, whatever. Like, she can tell you that and even tell you the key and all that good stuff. May not be able to build lots of jazz chords per se, but uh, can write some killer chord progressions. It's almost like what she knows, she knows really, really, really well. As opposed to maybe having a, this huge breadth of knowledge about chords and then not really know how to, how to work them. She really knows how to work. You really That's do. Really you, nice. It's it's quite it's quite amazing. So, uh, okay. So, what elements comprise or make up a great song, in your opinion? Do all great songs tell mm -hmm. a story, have a hook, etc.? But uh, and this is Jerry, who who's in the program. Um, by the way, spouses of honorary cousins are honorary cousins. So we, we're <laughs> honorary cousins. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, what what elements comprise or make up a great song? Do all songs tell a story? I have think. A hook? I think great songs have just this combination of uh, a melody that moves you, a story that moves you, an idea that's slightly different. Or I mean, I think I think all great songs have a hook. I mean, I think it's what makes whatever makes a song memorable. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, sometimes, the, but I they feel like when it has all of those things, it's the special songs. When it has the emotion, it's telling some kind of story. And it melodically is uh, accomplishing that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what's, I mean, it's music is so subjective. What's a great song to somebody is not a great song to somebody else. But I think just the craft of songwriting, I think, you know, we all we don't all like the same things as songwriters, but I think we all agree on what a great song is. You know, in Nashville, there's a thing every year called the NSAI 10 Songs I Wish I'd Written, and it's voted on by songwriters for songwriters, and they award those uh, to the top 10 songs that they wish they'd written that year. And I'm always, uh, I'm always surprised that, or not surprised, that it's always, we all kind of agree on what the great, songs are that year you know we might mm -hmm. get a list of 150 songs and when it comes down to those 10 songs i'm like yep those are the 10 yeah i would have picked and you know we all they're picked by songwriters because they're picked by songwriters not by who's the, getting paid <laughs> yeah or a label or right, whatever yeah. else it's, it's a legit peer, a peer award and you've yeah. been you've actually won that twice i have yeah and that was a <laughs> all right thank you so much to we got a let's see here Oh, Brian, thank you, buddy. That's that's our lunch fund right that's there so today. Sweet. Thank you, Brian. I uh, appreciate that, my friend. Beautiful. I saw a great question here and somebody from Bucks County. Where in Bucks County? My what? store is in New Hope. I love New Hope. V and my parents lived in Ben Salem. Nice. Oh, yay. Right. And went to the... Where in Bucks County? I grew up in Langhorne, uh, Pennsylvania, and I went to uh, Council Rock High School, if that helps any. Yeah. And I love New Hope, and I probably shopped at your store if yeah. it's been there a while. And the Neshaminy Mall. The Neshaminy Mall. Neshaminy. Yeah. <laughs> I remember <Gosh>. that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if this is on the spot, but uh, just brag for a minute. I've mentioned some songs that you've written. You've had two on... Uh, so what were the the two on Garth Brooks were Cold Like That uh -huh, and, and Midnight Train. Midnight Train. I've had Carrie Underwood. Carrie you had Underwood. First album. First album. Reba McIntyre. What I had was the one on the first album? Her. It was called um, I'm Gonna Take That Mountain. No, uh, Carrie Underwood. Oh, that's where it is. That's where it is. So uh, Reba McIntyre, I'm Gonna Take That Mountain. Mm -hmm. I had a song on Eli Young Band called Say Good Night. I had um, Tyler Farr, uh, Guy Walks Into a Bar. Mm -hmm. David Nail, Red Light, Red Light, Lady A, Hurt, uh, and I've had a lot a like zillion other like uh, yeah Canadian Carry On, ones Olivia and... Holt, uh, yeah I had a, just had a top five uh, Brett Kissel in Canada and uh, you had a number one bluegrass song I had a number a few, one bluegrass song ago. with um, Marty Rabin who was one of my heroes growing up uh, he was uh, in a, oh my gosh. You told me the name of the band, but I... How can I not remember? I was going to say yeah. Sawyer Brown. It's not Sawyer Brown. It's a... Uh, 
take me to the church on Cumberland Road. I don't know. Oh my gosh. I just, Sorry, but anyway, it, he's amazing. Yeah. Hey Sage, how'd you hook up with this wonderful, talented lady? Uh, <laughs> there was like several people at. We both went to the same church. It's weird. We went to the same college. Mm -hmm. We went to a church in town here for Two years. Two of the same churches for years and didn't know each other. Yeah. And then we ended up both moving from that church to this other church because we had a pastor there that we really liked and he ended up starting his own church. And we ended up both going there, didn't know each other there. And we had several friends who were like, gosh, do you know Melissa? And they would say, hey, do you know Eric? And they'd always try to hook us up. They literally said, if you and Eric went out once, you guys would get married. You guys are like the same person. And that's pretty much what happened. And that's pretty much what happened at the end of our first date. I was like, there you are. Uh, I've been looking for you everywhere. And the um, and the pastor of those two churches was the one who married who us. Who married us. Yeah. yeah. And just Stan Mitchell. christened our little guy. That's right. That's right. Good friend. <laughs> Um, so that's how we met. And I dated a bunch of crazies in between then. <laughs> Me too. Hey. But it was so good for songwriting. It's so good, right? So many <laughs> songs. Where can aspiring songwriters get exposure? Um, get exposure. That's kind of hard. Like. Yeah, I mean, you know, in town, you know, doing writer's nights and open mic nights, I think, are the best way for aspiring writers to meet other aspiring writers and to kind of build a tribe. Uh, BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC, getting to know writer representatives at those performing rights organizations. Uh, and uh, NSAI, Nashville Songwriters Association International, is a great resource, uh, nonprofit organization for aspiring and uh, developed songwriters. Um, they have great workshops, songwriter expos. Uh, they're there to help, um, and they're a great resource for uh, you know having your songs listened to. They have industry people come and listen to songs. Um, it's a great place to meet other writers that are looking to do that. Having industry people come and network, they're awesome. So that's what I would. That's what I did when I moved to town, and that's what I would recommend other people doing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm just scanning through. There's some amazing questions here. We just can't get to them all. If someone changes the key of your song, it's still the same song. There's yes. nothing, yeah. nothing's going to happen They almost there. always change the key of the song. Yeah. Um, there's so many great questions here. Oh, so kind. Um, how mm -hmm. do you make money as a songwriter? How much does a songwriter make? <laughs> that varies. <laughs> That's a question. Um, you know, we make our money through several different ways. Whenever you hear a song playing uh, on the radio, live at a show, that's called a performance royalty. And we make that money, uh, which is collected through ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Uh, we also make money through mechanical royalties, which are albums sold. There's not as much of that anymore, and we're still trying to work out le legislation for streaming uh, and what that looks like. We haven't gotten paid a lot for streaming things like Spotify up until now. A very important law was just passed that will hopefully help us. Uh, Spotify just challenged it, and so we're kind of... Boo at, Spotify. At, boo Spotify, yeah. Yeah. Not very Apple cool. Music's the only one who didn't fight our rate increase, which is the first piece of meaningful legislation in 110 years. Yeah, we're the only ones who are held to a court-appointed rate for what we do. I mean, basically, Apple, if your job, basically, that's like saying your job, whatever it is, the court appointed a certain percentage. price per hour that you would get paid, and they did that. And you can't like raise it unless you go back to decades court. Decades ago. So like an actor getting paid for a movie, the more popular they are, the more money they can make. But that's not like that for us. And we're under um, under supported. So we, we have to fight very hard. And we have a very small lobbying ability. So the big companies like... Like Spotify, Google, Amazon. Have you, they have the money to fight it. And yeah. then songwriters are sitting there trying to say, really, we like to feed our children. It'd yeah. be cool, you know. And once an artist has recorded the song, we don't have the say to be able to pull it off Spotify or anything like that. So we're kind of just at the mercy of that. So that's how we, and we also make money through an advance if we're writing for a publishing company. So we're paid in advance a year to write and fulfill a contract requirement uh, for turning in songs and uh, commercially viable songs. And mm -hmm. then we're paid in advance that's kind of like a salary. 
I'm seeing lots of questions here, so I'm going to sum them all up in one. But you know, I have songs that are written music, uh, but how to get them in the right hands. Hi from North Carolina. Nashville's not an option. The first step online to getting an original song noticed if you're an unknown songwriter. And I've seen like three or four of those already. Melissa did mention that already, but just in a nutshell, um, you know, can, it's you really, want to address that. It's really hard to get an unpublished song recorded because there's so much liability. Uh, you know, if uh, let's say another published writer turns in a song with the same title, that's kind of the same idea, somebody might say, you know, who just turned in an unpublished song said, well, well, I, I wrote that 10 years ago. And um, there, there's some legality involved in that. And so a lot of times record labels, artists, and other published songwriters won't listen to unsolicited material. That's what that means, unsolicited material. So it's very, very difficult. My advice if you if moving to Nashville isn't an option and being a professional songwriter isn't an option is to do it yourself. There's so many ways to do it uh, online now to be your own artist or, you know, link up with a local artist that would want to record it or something like that. But getting it cut with a Nashville recording artist would be very difficult, unpublished. Mm -hmm. You just got to think like it's, it's like anything else that you want to do. You have to be around those people. And, uh, you know, people ask me, you know, about YouTube. Well, how do I get started on YouTube? Well, you get started on YouTube. Well, how do you get started playing guitar? You get start. you play the guitar. Like you have to, you can't wait. It never happens that you go to the front of the line. It doesn't happen in any industry with anything ever. So it def definitely doesn't happen with songwriting because a lot of people want to be songwriters or rock stars or actors or whatever. So those are the industries that tend to have the most competition. So the way to do it is to just dig your heels in, start working your ass off. I mean, that's the only truth. Anything else of that's a lie. So it's really, it's like getting in the community, working your ass off, meeting with everybody you possibly can. And if you don't do that, you 100% aren't going to make it. It's but it really not, is more being, possible yeah. than ever to be able to do it on your own, by yourself, and uh, building a following. I mean, that still requires a lot of work, but building your own following on social media and recording your own music and being able to get it out just you couldn't do that in the old days you had to do it through a record label to get exposure now you can build your own exposure if you work hard enough at it and put your songs out yourself mm -hmm. and retain more of the money that way mm -hmm. indeed so this is a great question from climber 7565 always has some really good questions do words and emotions closely translate to particular notes or scales and to add on to him, what what's being asked there do you are you cognizant of that when you're playing or do you think that just kind of comes out naturally like when you hit a minor chord that there's a, a sadder lyric there or do you try to exploit that at all um, I think that just happens naturally. I don't think we're thinking about it too much. But like you said, it's like if we're playing minor chords, it sounds more sad. If you're playing mm -hmm. bluesy chords, it sounds more bluesy. You know, yeah. or you know, you play a one five four, you know, C F G. It's gonna sound like a power right, rock song yeah. or something. You know, yeah. it just uh, it just kind of happens. And I think everybody does it differently. Like for yeah. me, I have songs where I'm telling a story and it's in a major key and then I'll throw in a minor chord and then I'll throw in a little like, it's almost like a, if it were a movie, it would be foreshadowing of what mm -hmm. might be coming. Uh, so that chord changes and I'll specifically put a line in there that matches that chord that's like, yeah, but, and then it keeps the listener, you know, holding on. That's just something that, that I've noticed that I've done um, but everybody's different. But to answer the question, yes, I do think that they closely translate to notes and scales. I just don't think we're thinking about doing it when it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a great one. Do you think of the tune first or do you come up with a phrase and build from there? Um, I think I kind of answered that before, but yeah, it's, it's different every day. Um, some days it's from a phrase and an idea and then build a melody and some days there's a piece of a melody and then we'll uh, write an idea to that. It's different every day. It's mostly what inspires us. Yeah, and you know, you're gonna find out that one person will do it differently than others. In Nashville, the idea and the hook, right, is so is so important. Yeah. Whereas in pop music, you could be, you could say absolutely anything. No one's listening. 
Uh, no one really yeah. is listening to the lyrics, right? I would just say in country, it's more lyric forward, and I think mm -hmm. writers spend more time on the lyric and making sure that it's a strong lyric. And mm -hmm. I would say in pop music, that focus is spent more on melody and making sure that, that it has a lot of melodic hooks. Like in pop, I feel like they're thinking of every section of the song as being a melodic hook and being just as catchy as the chorus. And I think in country, we think of the chorus as being catchy and the rest of it making sure the lyric drives home. Yes. Hope I don't offend anybody by yeah. saying no, that. No, no, I think that's great. Ben Fitzpatrick. Uh, ben, thank you so much. Uh, he's saying, do you have any? Do you have any tips for rock <laughs> for rock guitar? But I think <laughs> I wish I did, but I can't even play yeah. country guitar. <laughs> yeah. You know the way the way Melissa plays is. I mean, if you, if you didn't know any better, you know. I mean. You'd have to look at her hands. That's why I'm looking at her hands as I'm playing because I mean I've played these songs before, but I've I've forgotten them and and so I'm looking at her hands because I'm able to I know what she's doing according to how many frets she goes up or I got a basic idea. Uh, it's always a nightmare at writers' nights yeah. because other guitar players <laughs> will look at me and look at my hands and what they're doing and it's not corresponding to how they know how no. to play and so like it's just inevitable. I'll see them start trying and they're they're wanting to play with me and help me out and it's like not in the right key or anything because they're like what are you doing it's not gonna happen what is right? it <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> abort <laughs> okay uh friends we're gonna do one more question then we're gonna do rapid fire okay. okay rapid fire questions you haven't you don't know anything about these and um and then okay will you do one more for us Yes. And I'll ask you about that song to, to, to let us know about what that song's about beforehand. Is that cool? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So can you, we've talked about this before as, as far as like copyrights and stuff, and this may not be something you want to talk about right now, but, mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's not even necessarily one to end with. Maybe we'll do two of them. But as far as like copy, copywriting, we've, we've come across this before. What is the... Like, what do songwriters do in Nashville in regards to copywriting songs? Like, how does that work? Um, well, specifically, his question, is it possible to copyright a song title? It is not. The song titles are not copyrightable. The song itself is copyrightable, uh, but not the, the title. Titles are um, open game. Yep. Um, and without having finished the song yet, I don't know that I've... Ever done that? But I believe you can. I think you can copyright a part of a song, register it with the copyright office. But not the title. <laughs> like, but not uh, just the title. It has to be a song, music lyrics. Like What a Mess is a song that, mm. that you and I have done before, have written, and it was uh, a little project that we have called Kirby and the Roaches. And uh, we were listening to that this weekend because we were thinking about possibly doing it, but we were doing all of Melissa's songs because you're going to know those a lot better. But nonetheless, I looked that up and there was... 10 people who yeah. have a song called What a Mess. There's probably hundreds of any, you oh, know, yeah. hit you've heard. There's probably hundreds of songs that have that title. Yeah. All right, let's do let's do one more. Jerry, bye-bye Spotify. Oh, thanks, my friend. Yeah, oh, it's thank true. You. It's true. More people that oh. can do it. She, yeah. she said I played like Dolly Parton. Yes. Oh. It's like if Dolly Parton and Keith, Keith Richards had a baby, <laughs> then it'd be my guitar playing. Okay, uh, this is this would be a great last question, I think, and then we'll go do rapid fire. Okay, does commercial does commerciality commercially viable commercial, commercially viable have certain requirements? Two and a half minutes, etc. Um, I believe in our contracts, it just kind of says commercially viable, and that's left uh, to the publisher. But usually, man, if we're just trying to write a song that is commercial and that fits in the market and that isn't just, you know, writing a poorly written song that it usually counts towards our requirement. And the requirements usually 12 full written songs a year. So, you know, that'd be 24 co-written songs, 36 three-way written songs. And you have to turn them in in a certain amount of time um, to receive the next advance period. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a three to four year contract. Great. Okay. Um, 
All right, let's go ahead and, uh, friends, really quickly, we're going to do rapid-fire questions <laughs> here in just one moment. But, Melissa, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for I having me. I feel like me. there's 10 million things we did not talk about. So if you guys want to see Melissa back here again, let us know in the comments. Just go ahead and literally put that right now if you want to see her again. I have a feeling you do because this <laughs> has been the most action that we've had in a long time. And I feel like we've got a lot of people watching. When I looked here just now, we had, yeah, 245 people wow. on on YouTube, and then uh, you know Facebook. We got some kids watching too, so I don't know how many. 27 right there. Okay, so so cool. But do let us know if you would like that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna get to some rapid fire questions, and then I want you to explain this song that we're gonna hear at the end, and. Um, Cool, yeah, right? Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then, oh, friends, real quick, we have uh, two things. We've got a post that's on Instagram and Facebook, okay? Here's what you got to do. Like, comment, and share. Obviously, you have to be following. Like, comment, and share, okay? And the way you share that is you're going to hit that little paper airplane button. You're going to share that to your stories. Don't send anything to us. We know what we're doing. Uh, send it so other people can know what we're doing. Cool? And then also we have one on Facebook. Do the same. What we do after the broadcast is we pick somebody who's been kind enough to share that and do all of what we just mentioned there and we award them with a lifetime membership to the Unstoppable Guitar System slash 365. Cool? With that being said, we had this massive broadcast this weekend. We had Literally, I think 10,000 people now who have watched the video, I think, since Saturday. Or not, it's very close to that. And we had a wow. blast learning how to play chords all across the neck. In that broadcast, we announced that we're doing 75% off of everything in my program except for the Unstoppable Guitar System slash 365, which is 55% off, basically equating to less than $15 a month for a year. And so if you equate that, friends, it's really, really cheap. It's 222 bucks off, I think it was, 222, something like that. 222 bucks off, and you have a lifetime of lessons. Over 1,000 videos, over 600 jam tracks, live broadcast from me all the time. So if you want to be part of that, there is a link that's in the description of this video. Check that out, okay? Otherwise, that's all I'm going to tell you about that. You you know what to do. Okay, you ready for some rapid fire questions here, Melissa? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you just have to answer these as quickly as okay. possible. Um, <clears throat> not, not too much overthinking on this, okay? Okay. Beatles or Stones? Beatles. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Billy Joel or Elton John? Oh. oh. Do I have to pick one? You have Too to close pick to one. It's, you're on, it's a desert, Billy desert Joel. island. Billy Joel. Okay, Billy Joel. Yeah, I think he's got more hits. Although Elton John. I would think I probably listened. I know. Yeah. You can only pick one. I, I'm going Billy There's Joel. There's only enough coconuts for the two. <laughs> uh, Reba or Dolly? Oh, no. That's terrible. I know it is. That's, well, you can only pick one. Go with your gut. Dolly. I know, I know, and I but love Reba. Reba's I love everything. Reba, but Dolly's like both. I they're both, both veterans. Yeah. Okay, Moana or Coco? <laughs> <laughs> Moana. Our, our little boy loves both of those, right? So, all right, here you go. I feel like I've watched them both enough to accurately call that. All right, here we go. Um, pizza or tacos? Pizza. Yoga or meditation? Yoga. You're going to be mad at me for this one. He Stopped Loving Her Today <laughs> or The Gambler? He Stopped Loving Her Today. Really? Okay. Yes. That's what I'd have gone with, too. Hands but The down. Gambler's amazing. The Gambler's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. Your but He Stopped Loving Her Today is my favorite song oh, in the history my, of ever. Ever. Yeah. So, yeah. Hands no, I, oh, Man, it's really close up there for me, too. Uh, favorite song ever? He Stopped Loving Her Today. Really? Okay. Well, yeah. there you go. Easy enough. <laughs> okay. Um, Jon Snow or Jamie Lannister? <gasps> Oh, that's horrible, too. <laughs> oh, I like them both for different reasons. Jon Snow. Jon Snow, right? If I was going to go guy. for a bad guy, then be, be one-handed Jamie, Jamie would be <laughs> it for me. One-handed Jamie. <laughs> Might be lame, actually. <laughs> uh, so that if you, if you guys... What was it? Lamey. Lamey. <laughs> so if you guys are uh, Game of Thrones fans like we are, that's uh, yes. a couple of the, the bigger uh, <laughs> characters in the story there. So... All right, beautiful. Uh, Melissa, again, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. And um, 
So this was so fun. Yeah. So we'll definitely do it again because we had some amazing questions and we still didn't get to everything. Can you tell us about this last song? Okay, this last song I wrote with uh, Jonathan Singleton and Brad Tercy. Brad Tercy's in the group Old Dominion, if you guys have heard of them. Uh, and Brad came in with the idea for this song, and he said, Don't think I'm crazy, but what if we wrote a song like the joke, A Guy Walks Into a Bar? And we loved it immediately, but didn't quite know what to do with it. Didn't know if it should be a serious song or a silly song. And uh, we kind of landed on it being a, a serious song, like about a breakup, but using language like the joke in the verses and um the way this song got recorded was really organic it wasn't through uh, it being pitched to a record label or anything like that my co-writer jonathan was playing the song out at a nashville writer's night um and tyler far walked in and heard him play it and fell in love with the song and said he wanted to record it and said if you let me record that song i'll make it the first single off of my new album Whoa. which is why you have to be in nashville which is why you have to be in nashville and uh and he recorded it and he was true to his word and he made it his first single off of his last album that was out and uh this song is the testimony to me about not giving up because uh i've had some good successes in my years in nashville but this became my first number one in country yeah. after 15 years of writing. And that was fun watching that, that song climb. That was so fun. So fun. <laughs> it's like, it's almost there, please go. And I please, was nine please. months pregnant, almost 10 months pregnant at my number one party. Yeah. So I was like, my little guy's getting to Aww. share my number one with me. Beautiful. My number one and my number one. That's right. Guy walks into a bar. Guy walks into a bar. Here we go. Thanks for having me. See you next week, y'all.